I've been a pretty big fan of anime for a while, though I wouldn't say I've seen quite as much as a lot of my peers. Something I've always appreciated about it, though is just how many genres it's able to cover. From a futuristic murder mystery to a tale of two brothers trying to repair their bodies after tapping into forbidden alchemy. One particular genre I've always had a very special appreciation for, though, is mecha anime. I love mechas. Those awesome stories about humans overcoming their foes by jumping into giant robots and going to war is something I can't get enough of. And it feels like a lot of people have been really coming to appreciate the genre lately as well, with stuff like Pacific Rim and Genlock taking some obvious inspiration from the classic mecha anime of old, like Gundam and Giant Robo. One of the best aspects of the genre has always been the ability to take a crazy and fantastic concept like people piloting giant metal versions of themselves and using that backdrop as a way to dissect certain aspects of the human condition. Condition, like how Evangelion tackles ideas of loneliness and religion, or Mobile Suit Gundam discusses the nature and consequences of warfare, or even how Pacific Rim portrays a lesson about making yourself vulnerable and breaking down barriers so people can work together and survive. This idea is something that's always drawn me to the genre, and it's a big influence on the mecha story I'm writing myself, but of course I'd be lying if I said that a huge draw to mechas wasn't just how cool they are. And with an idea as appealing and exciting as this, video games about piloting mechas were always going to be inevitable. Mecha assaults, Armored Core, Metal Warriors, Metal Tech, there's no shortage of mecha games out there. It's hard to say that they've ever dominated the market per se, but they always seem to have a certain level of presence. One franchise in this subject of games always had me very curious though, and that would be the Konami series called Zone of the Enders. Such a cool name, really neat mecha designs and promises of unique and thrilling gameplay, and yet I've heard so little about their actual quality. With the game being produced by Hideo Kojima and characters designed by Yoji Shinkawa, who were both well known for their work in the Metal Gear series, this has been one of those games people seem to know about but doesn't get talked about all that much, though it does usually get referenced for how it was packaged with a playable demo for the highly anticipated Metal Gear Solid 2 which came out shortly after Zone of the Enders release. A lot of people picked up this game just so they could get a taste of the next adventure featuring Solid Snake, which yeah, I guess we'll have to talk about that at some point too whenever I get around to reviewing that series. Still, with so much about this game that seemed promising but the absolute silence regarding it, I thought it was finally time to pick the game up and see what my thoughts were on it. Now, I'm actually playing this game for the first time to review it, but I'll actually be looking at the remastered version from the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360's Zone of the Enders HD collection, as it's the version that I think will be more relevant to everyone, that is, at least for the first game, but we'll be getting deeper into that in the next review. It's kind of neat how this was packaged with a demo for Metal Gear Rising Revengeance following in its footsteps of the original release. I wonder if the promise of a demo for the Metal Gear series helped sell the HD collection like it did the original. It's time to unravel the mystery. What's this game all about? How does it hold up? And, well, is it even worth talking about today? Spoilers ahead, gang. It's time to hop on into Zone of the Enders. So right off the bat, I really have to appreciate the cool anime opening that was created for the HD collection. It lasts five and a half minutes, shows off cool designs and concepts of the two games that come with it, and the production value is pretty dang nice. If you've never played these games, you won't have any context for a single thing that's popping up on screen, but hey, at least it looks cool. Once you get to the main menu, ah, uh, wow. Yeah, you can definitely tell that this took some influence from Metal Gear Solid. I kind of wish this game would have learned a bit more from that series, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Once we start the game proper, we're introduced to the world of the game. The year is 2172, and mankind has created space colonies across the stars. We see an extremist group called Bahram swooping in to attack the Jupiter colony of Antilles with a mission to obtain two specific experimental orbital frames, which is what the mechas in this series are called. This one woman, Viola, is given a bit of a focus here, and it's alluded to that she has some sort of personal attachment to this particular mission. We're then shown a young man named Leo, a child living on the colony as it gets attacked, and I already have a couple of issues with this. We we see Leo running past a bunch of bodies and getting flashbacks to something that happened just before this when he and his friends were caught dumpster diving, I guess? And this lady is, yeah, I don't know what she's doing or who she is to these kids. She's got a bunch of them tied up and is acting pretty threatening towards them because they were digging through trash, but who is she? A teacher? A landscaper? A grouchy old neighbor who doesn't like kids selling lemonade across from her house? And what? Is she gonna call their parents or kill them? It's really unclear what exactly is even happening here. She keeps calling the kids Enders, too. Now, this is actually a term that's used a lot in this franchise, but in this 
first game, it's not explained what it means. An explanation comes later in the franchise, sure, but you would think that since this term is used in the name of the franchise, the first outing would have some sort of explanation as to what it even means. Well, the other kids kind of throw Leo under the bus and blame him for telling them all to go there, but no, screw that kid. He could have just as easily said no and gone back to playing Hopscotch or Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever it is kids in the future do, but no, you decided to join in on the Trash Cuisine Sour Hour with no one to blame but yourself. So then Baram shows up and attacks and one of the mechas falls over and lands on Leo's pals who, for some reason, didn't think getting up and moving would be a good idea? I mean, okay, their hands are tied behind them, but I dare you, I dare you to tell me that would keep them from using their legs. Well, now they're stupid and dead, so I guess it doesn't really matter. No idea what happened to Cranky Greta, though. So Viola takes notice of Leo and he gets away. Again, I don't understand why this information was told this way. It's not like we get glimpses of the flashback so it can all be revealed to us later. No, it's just all told to us in this weird, out-of-order way because, well, because. Leo runs off from his hiding hole and just sort of stumbles across this big blue orbital frame and when a giant explosion that should have killed him knocks him closer to the thing, he just sort of falls into the cockpit and somehow fights off against one of the Raptor class drones. After he uses anime protagonist powers to destroy the robot, the AI of the frame, Ada, wakes up and is now a little confused that Leo is in the frame that we now know is called Jehuti as someone else was scheduled to pilot it. But for the sake of survival, Ada gives Leo a crash course on how Jehuti works and in turn gives the player a chance to familiarize themselves with the controls. Jehuti flies around the area and locks onto enemies and when doing so, the camera pans around and tilts in a way that really looks nice and helps add a bit of intensity to the battles. It honestly might be my favorite unique aspect of the game. With two of the face buttons being used for ascending and descending, the other two are used for primary weapons and sub weapons. The sub weapons are obtained later on in the game, but they are pretty straightforward. Each one seems to have a different effect on a different enemy. So there's a fun, almost Mega Man style challenge of figuring out which sub weapons work best against certain enemies or bosses. The main weapons are handled in a rather interesting way too. If you use the main weapons from a distance, you'll get a basic ranged attack, but when using them up close to an enemy, the attack becomes a melee one using your sword. You can also use dashing with the right trigger to manipulate the attacks in different ways. Dashing while using a ranged attack will result in a burst of projectiles that can cover a wide area or hit multiple targets at once. By dashing while using a melee attack, you can perform a much stronger slash that can typically break through most enemy defenses. Finally, if you sit still and hold the dash button and then use your main weapons, they have a unique effect as well. For ranged, you get this projectile that feels somewhere between a spirit bomb and a hadouken. For melee, you get this spinning slash that can be rather helpful when you're surrounded. Jehuti is pretty versatile and it's nice to see so much at your arsenal right from the get-go, but there is something that sours it a bit for most of the game in that you really don't need to use that much of Jehuti's moveset. Dash up to enemies and hit the attack button. With two or three hits, they'll just go down and they'll barely even be able to put up a fight. They just sort of die on command. The game will try to convince you that using ranged attacks, while it does take longer, is a good way to fight off enemies and avoid taking damage. So it seems like the sensible thing to do if you're already kind of beat up, but that won't really be a problem if you don't take damage. So yeah, you know what? Just brush in and take them out before they can even do anything. Thankfully, you can't get away with that as much in the harder difficulties. I was glad to see that hard mode helps even out the playing field a tad and taking damage means a bit more. If you want a challenge, go for the harder difficulties. You'll get much more out of the experience. We're also introduced to Metatron, which is a substance that the orbital frame uses to repair itself. We have obtained the Metatron ore. It's basically just the health pickup for the game, but as the franchise progresses, it becomes a much more relevant plot device. As of this game, we don't really have much of a context for what this stuff even is to the people of the universe, but the next game will enlighten us a bit. For now, just think of it as the stuff that makes you stop feeling ouch. Once Leo gets back outside, he's attacked by more drones and Viola shows up to take Jehuti, but fails to beat Leo and is ordered by her superiors to retreat. She doesn't like it much, but she complies, and I just have to say, I love this little exchange here. I can detect no sign of vital activity. You mean that everyone is dead? That is correct. Good work, sir. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, the Space Force, yes, that's actually what they're called, and yeah, it also does sound just as stupid in fiction as it does in real life, contacts Leo and informs him that the pilot that was originally scheduled to man Jehuti was killed in the attack, so now since Leo is the only available person who can pilot the metal behemoth, they need him to battle his way through the Bahram commanders on the base and deliver the orbital frame to the Space Force so they can get it to safety. Leo refuses, though, as he doesn't want to kill anybody and doesn't want to be treated like a weapon, and okay, I'm cool with that, but even after they explain 
explained to him that his inaction would result in countless deaths for possibly the entire space colony he calls home, he still decides to whine about not wanting to do anything. Am I supposed to like this twerp? The way he talks, I don't believe that he doesn't want to kill anybody because he believes murder is wrong. He just seems to have this weird superiority complex where he thinks he's above the people in the military because he hasn't had to kill anyone yet. Again, I understand his hesitance as a first reaction. He's just a kid thrown into the middle of a war zone, but if the game wants me to believe that this child can pilot a developmental mecha with, I'm assuming, no experience at all, I would have to assume that his ability to pick up on stuff that quickly means, oh, I don't know, that he's not a complete brain dead idiot. People are going to die. People have died, and somehow he pushes all his hate and blame onto the people that are trying to prevent it from happening? If you're thinking it's because he has some kind of history with the military and has some distrust and hatred for them buried somewhere within him because of that, well, that was my first thought too, but no, that's not the case. There's nothing like that, not in this game anyway, so instead we're just left with this kid hesitating to go save people, not because he's scared, but because of spite for reasons we don't understand, reasons that are never explained to us. Yeah, a real solid protagonist, guys. I really want to put up with this twerp for the rest of the adventure. This bland method of exposition bothers me too. You just kind of sit here in the middle of the environment, stuck in one place, listening to the voices of characters you can't see, babble on incessantly, which isn't helped by the awful delivery from Leo's voice actor. You can look around, cool, but you still can't move anywhere and are forced to look around at a place you might want to go explore, but it's too bad because you're going to sit here and listen to Leo whine at everyone. I'm assuming that this was an attempt at creating a version of the Kodak conversations from the Metal Gear Solid series, but frankly, it misses the mark and, in a way, the charm. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Kodak conversations from MGS are not perfect, not by a long shot, especially when some of the games in the series have them going on for over 20 minutes and even much longer, but they were still Still more effective because we got to see the characters we were talking to either in motion or in this fantastic art by Yoji Shinkawa, and the exchanges were actually interesting. And as if I really have to say it, players actually like hearing Snake interact with people. All that Leo ever did was make me question the pros and cons of skipping the cutscenes altogether in case I would end up missing some kind of important plot detail. Metal Gear Solid has a sense of humor too, but I digress. Excuse me, can I make an observation? Sure. You are worthless. Leo reluctantly agrees to help out a little bit, but wants to make it very clear that he's not out to kill people and really rubs it in that he thinks the people trying to protect the colony are monsters because they've killed in battle. So Ada instructs Leo on how to obtain new programs, which are scattered around the different levels of the game. These programs will often be locked away with a passcode, meaning that the player will be required to defeat a certain group of enemies and obtain the passcode before being able to download the programs. That does mean that there will be times you find a program you need to download but can't access it until you get the passcode from a bunch of enemies that are in another level entirely. Now that on its own really isn't too bad, but I'll elaborate on that a bit more later. Moving from level to level makes enough sense. Leo flies up above the cities of the colony and makes his way to the next location from the air. Visually, it's much more interesting than a standard level select screen for sure, but I think it helps highlight one of my bigger complaints about the game's presentation, and that would be just how boring this game is to look at. On a level of craftsmanship, it's outstanding. Don't get me wrong, the HD version of the game looks crisp and clean and all of the textures pop really nicely, but on a design level, it takes maybe two levels to start feeling really dull. Every once in a while, you'll see a structure or building that stands out and looks interesting, but most of the time, the designs of the cities and environments all look incredibly flat. Even the areas that I'm assuming are meant to be used for growing resources like food or trees for oxygen aren't being used very well by the colonists because they're entirely empty and lifeless. When you're on your way to the next level in the overworld, the only thing telling you where to go is the names of each location that pops up above the levels and the mission objectives Ada gives you because there isn't anything visually distinct about any of these locations, which is a real shame. I can at least understand why there aren't a ton of tiny NPCs running around all over the place because I'm not sure how well the PS2 would have handled that sort of thing at the time, and I don't think the developers wanted to push their luck on that one. And besides, any sort survivors on this colony wouldn't be running around on the streets. They'd all be huddled away within the buildings, which leads Leo to the city block he grew up in, where the occupied buildings are under attack by a bunch of Bahram drones, and he finds his little friend Selvis, and ugh, these exchanges hurt to listen to. Selvis! That is you! Isn't it, Selvis? Are you alright, Selvis? Leo? Is that you, Leo? 
What are you doing here? What are you doing here? We could take a child and prop them up on a couple of beams the length of trains, and it still wouldn't come off as stilted as this dialogue. Leo's chat with his bestie gets interrupted by the first boss of the game, a large frame known as the Tempest, and this is where the gameplay starts to get a lot more engaging. The game expects you to study the opponent and pay attention to how they move so you can avoid damage and keep an eye out for good openings to attack. It's not a super tough fight or anything, but it offers up a bit more of a challenge than what's come before, and that's certainly welcome. Of course, once the enemy is down for the count, Leo refuses to deal the final blow and the pilot escapes to presumably kill countless more innocent civilians. Good on you, Leo. Hey Morty, remember when you said selling a gun was as bad as pulling the trigger? How do you feel about all these people that are getting killed today because of your choices? Okay, I need to take a second to address this because I know some people are gonna bring it up, but yeah, I do like a hero who refuses to kill. Characters like Batman and Spider-Man who live by a strict moral code that prevents them from taking another life and willing to bear the responsibility of that choice no matter what, but what makes it work for me is the motivation. They're actively going out of their way to make things harder for themselves when killing the enemy would just make things easier for everyone, but they hold fast to their convictions simply because they truly believe it's the right thing to do. It'd be too damned easy. All I've ever wanted to do is kill him. A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others, and then end him. But if I do that, if I allow myself to go down into that place, I'll never come back. I know this whole complaint about Leo makes me sound like a psychopath, so please understand that my big problem with this is not the fact that a child isn't running around murdering people, that's not my point. What I'm trying to get at is the motivations, as I think that's an integral part of the actions of any given character. Leo doesn't have any motivations besides saving his own skin until the game decides it wants me to magically believe he's developed later, when in reality, it's just inconsistent writing. Whenever the lives of others are brought up, he dismisses it and shows how little he cares. Forget about them! Leo couldn't give two Kojima is about anybody's lives, which makes it hard for me to believe that his refusal to kill is at all connected to him understanding and respecting the weight of another person's life. The hero of our story, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe he's so adamant about this because seeing his friends die made him feel the full weight of the effects of death, and he can't bear to bring that on someone else. But his complete disregard for anyone that isn't him or Selvis makes me think otherwise. At least we do have Selvis along for the ride now, as she hops into JQT with Leo and convinces him to actually go help people that are out there dying and save civilians. This opens up SOS missions, where certain areas around the colony will be under attack and the player is tasked with going in and fighting off all the drones in the area. What makes this kind of tricky is that the buildings around you that are housing the survivors take damage and not a lot of it, meaning that the scuffling between you and the mindless robots can very easily result in a lot of collateral damage. I'm pretty sure I was given the same miserable rank for every single SOS mission I took because I just had so much trouble trying not to destroy the property around me while I was fighting. As for the other mission types, the game will send you out to a few different locations to break down the force fields all around the colony, so Leo can reach the Space Force and give them Jehuti. Along the way, you'll pick up new sub-weapons to use in battle, slap tin cans around till the game tells you you've leveled up, and do a lot of aimless wandering. One particular boss requires you to get leveled up and obtain certain weapons before you can properly fight it. Trouble is, the game barely gives you any indication as to where you can actually find this stuff. You just have to hop around from level to level and hope it's the right location to find what you need, and I feel like this kind of crap takes up way more of the game's time than it has any right to. Do you find it enjoyable to move from level to level in all of these boring environments just trying to find where in the world the passcode or program is? Well, I certainly don't, and I'm baffled as to why the developers thought this was the way to go. If nothing else, all this running around does mean that the fight and overall victory over the tyrant feels a lot more satisfying, which is a plus in my book, but I still don't see any reason that there couldn't have been a bit more direction in this crazy fetch quest. There are a few things about this structure that I do like, I'll give it that. At one point, the gang finds themselves at a force field that can only be traveled through by hacking an enemy Raptor class drone and controlling it remotely to destroy the generator powering the field. Along the way, the Raptor picks up a program that allows it to see cloaked enemies, but obviously that ability doesn't just automatically transfer over to Jehuti, so when you reach a level where there's a bunch of invisible enemies, you have to go find the Raptor right where you left it and destroy it to get the program. There's a certain level of logic in place there that I really like and find pretty engaging. Thankfully, once the Tyrant is destroyed, the pacing gets a lot better. The Raptors were all being controlled by this massive Tyrant frame 
frame, so taking it out gets the majority of the colony out of danger. So you can spend the rest of the game actually progressing from level to level with no meandering, and the bosses, which are already my favorite part of the game, become a lot more frequent. The story also starts getting a bit more interesting, as Viola shows up again and makes it very clear that her pursuit of Jehuti is very personal, for reasons that we're not privy to, and she and Leo have a vicious fight that she gets pretty messed up in. Leo even tries but fails to kill Viola, and for the first time in the game, it feels like it's actually because he cares about the bigger picture. He makes a firm decision to stay in Jehuti and fight, even though Ada tries to eject the cockpit and self-destruct, risking his own life to protect this artificial intelligence, leading Ada to have a rather surprising reaction. What you did to save me was very illogical. It took long enough to get to this point, and it's actually starting to feel like we have characters in this story, which is why it's too bad that the game is practically over. Yeah, so after that, Leo drops off Jehuti with one of the Space Force peeps who explains that Bahram has set up explosives to destroy the colony. He tries to convince Leo to help out one last time to save everyone at the colony, but... You are the only one who can save the colony. No! I don't want to do that. No. No. You were so close! You were almost a person! You were so close! So Vs even tries to get him to go, but he still refuses until Viola shows up out of absolutely nowhere and shoots her just to prove a point or something. Viola decides that was enough to get the plot moving again and takes off, and now Leo wants to jump back into Jehuti and actually save people. We get a bit of background about how Leo felt unwanted by his parents and just wants to jump on the opportunity to actually feel needed, so 95% into the game, the kid finally has a motivation and we can chalk it up to revenge and wanting to feel important. It's late, it's shallow, but at this point, I'll take it. Honestly, I think the most interesting thing about all of this is how Ada developed throughout the game. It's just weird to me that the most inhuman and robotic protagonist I've ever encountered is the one to inspire some humanity in this AI. All that's left is disposing of some bombs and fighting this crazy corrupted version of Viola. Leo tries to save her, but she tells him to back off, accepting her fate as she rockets towards Jupiter while giving her little speech that I think is supposed to make her feel sympathetic? Again, I gotta draw some comparisons to Metal Gear Solid here, as I feel it's supposed to resemble the final speeches from the Foxhound soldiers, but it's lacking a lot of that weight. Honestly, the only thing it does is make me see her as a crazy psychopath who's obsessed with strength and power. What's really interesting is that there's a nearly hour-long anime OVA serving as a prequel to this game that goes into detail about a really interesting and tragic story about how apparently Bahram was really behind creating what would inspire the designs of Jehuti and its mysterious sister Mecha Anubis, and we even get to see a lot about Viola's backstory and how she eventually became so deranged and bloodthirsty. Where was all of this info in the game? It's some really compelling stuff that really helps me appreciate the more interesting elements of this game's plot and universe, so why is it all relegated to a poorly dubbed OVA wandering around on the internet? No use crying over spilled anime, I guess, but the story here isn't quite over. Throughout the game, we've heard Viola communicate communicating with one of her higher-ups who mentioned a few times that they weren't just looking for Jehuti, but also its twin frame known as Anubis. Well, it looks like they were able to get their hands on at least one of their targets because the leader of Bahram shows up in Anubis and we absolutely stand no chance whatsoever in this fight. No, seriously, just survive. You can't fight this thing. You can't even touch this guy. He's fast, strong, teleports all over the place, is completely invincible, and is absolutely terrifying. If Zone of the Enders ever had a great moment of success, it was this. Anubis stuck in my mind as a force to be reckoned with, and as a player, I wanted nothing more than to build up my abilities and fight this guy again, but I did at least figure that wouldn't happen until the sequel. Leo just narrowly escapes and meets up with a space force who have been patching up Selvis. Ada reveals that her ultimate mission is to be flown into to the heart of Bahram's mother base on Mars and self-destruct, taking the whole thing down with it. This little exchange between Leo and Ada is surprisingly nice, but it really makes me wish more of the game's story could have been like this, with characters who are actually willing to risk their lives for others and care about one another. Better late than never? Yeah, no, not quite. As nice as this moment is, it's just too short to salvage the hours of time I've spent listening to Leo bicker in my ear and be the worst thing ever. Although admittedly, the irony of me spending this entire review whining about Leo is not lost on me. And that's the 
the game. I've already spent enough time bickering about the story. You already know what I think about it. The worst part about it is it actually really started to pick up for me a lot towards the end. Once you reach Viola for a rematch and we actually start to see our characters making an attempt to be likable, I was invested, but then the game was already over. That being said, if you're at all interested in this game or the rest of the series, be sure to look up the OVA titled 2167 Idolo on YouTube. This stuff is great if you can muscle past the woefully dated English dub. As for the actual gameplay, you might have noticed that this is where I had the nicest things to say, and that's because, at its core, Zone of the Enders can actually be a lot of fun to play. I think the use of camera angles and fast-paced action is remarkable, especially for the time, and those boss fights really are the highlight of the whole game for me, but the middle section where you're just running around from level to level aimlessly looking for a way to progress harms the overall quality a lot. Sure, it's not nearly as big of a problem on a second playthrough, as at that point, you'll likely know where you're going, but that really isn't me singing any praises. Oh yeah, singing. There was a soundtrack somewhere in here, right? Well, I guess it does its job in keeping an upbeat tempo for the gameplay, but that's about all it does, because for the most part, it just sort of fades into the background. I've played through this game more than once for the review, and I can't remember a single track of music from the entire game. The theme in the HD Collection's opening cinematic is great, but it's actually just taken from the second game in the series, so that doesn't really count towards this one. I would be remiss if I didn't point out some of the cooler details in the game, like just how great all the mechas look. I mean, Jehuti is just awesome, and Anubis is hauntingly mysterious. I love the Egyptian design. And this is small, but I also love how sliding around on the ground causes sparks to come off of Jehuti's feet as they grind along the floor. And yeah, I know, there's one aspect of the mecha designs in this game I'm sure some people have been waiting for me to address, but I'm gonna wait until I'm reviewing the sequel, as I'll have a bit more to say about it then. Also, I should probably address the HD collection as a whole. Where this first game is concerned, I don't have any real complaints. I actually think the game looks great, and while I've heard a lot of complaints about frame rate issues or graphical glitches, I never noticed them. Not to say they don't exist, I just haven't experienced it myself, so I can't really harp on the collection for that. That being said, there were two games included in this bundle, and I've heard one of them doesn't hold up nearly as well in the remaster as the other. So I guess we'll be finding out more about that when I take a look at the sequel, which despite my complaints, I'm actually really looking forward to reviewing. You know, there really is just something about the game that even beyond all my complaints really pulls me in, but the game as a whole? That's a little tough. So, do I recommend Zone of the Enders? You know, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed by now that I don't use a numbered ranking system when I review games, and honestly, stuff like this is a big reason as to why. More than anything, I want to be able to tell my viewers whether or not a game is worth their time. I fit it into pretty clear categories of yes or no, sure, but the rest of my review, or if nothing else, my final notes on it should help you decide if you would be an exception to the recommendation. If I have to use numbers to relay that information, I don't think I've done my job very well. So, I would have to say no. I would not recommend Zone of the Enders. It's got a solid core to its gameplay, but it's just bogged down by so much other crap. I just don't think it's worth the effort of tracking down. Me, personally, I would consider myself a fan of the series, and I know I'll be sitting down to play this game again in the future, but you better know I'm gonna be skipping all the cutscenes, which will come off as strange to some of my friends who know I'm a very narratively driven player. If you're still interested in what you've seen here, especially where the combat is concerned, then I say go for it, but just know the plot is not going to offer much. I've made a passing mention about the future of this franchise a couple of times throughout the review, but yeah, Zone of the Enders was able to get a prequel OVA, a 26 episode anime miniseries, an RPG spin-off game on the Game Boy Advance, and of course, a direct sequel on the PlayStation 2. I would actually like to take a look at all of it at some point in the future, but I think for the short term, we're just gonna take a look at the team that was tasked with making a direct sequel, and see if they were able to iron some stuff out, and see if they were able to make a unique, fun, and memorable experience out of it. So I hope you join me next time as we take a look at Zone of the Enders, the second runner. So of course, my lovely audience, subscribe if you feel so inclined, follow me on Twitter if you want to know what I'm up to, spread the word, tell your friends until we see each other again. Thank you so much for watching. See you next mission.